the, the bottom part, the red on the very bottom, that's kind of like considered like the epicenter or the point where the bomb goes off. And then the energy radiates outward, just like the seismic waves of an earthquake. Next slide. So now, just briefly, if you were in an apartment building, it would actually be safer to be in the middle of the apartment building and be away from the walls. So if there was a 10-story building, floors five and six would be safer, and the innermost apartment or hallway would be safer than the outer ones. Next slide. So this is just showing a blast wave and how the energy goes straight one way. Now this is the 160 kiloton explosion that would a North Korean attack could possibly produce. And again, it's 10 times the yield of what Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, and two times the destruction. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Okay, so the solutions to survival are your distance from the fallout ash, shielding, and time. And what shielding is, is, is exactly what it sounds like. How much mass or shield materials, such as a brick wall, books, wooden structures, any kind of shield between the nuclear blast fallout and your body. And I think Mike Benedetto pointed out at a couple of places where he spoke in handout flyers, does everyone know what to do if you see a flash of light and you know it's a nuclear bomb that just went off? Well, the answer to that question is, you lay down as flat as you can, or if there's a ditch, jump in the ditch, put your feet right towards where the flash of light was and cover your head because your feet will actually shield you a little bit from that nuclear blast fallout that's going to rush over your body. So, I mean, I hope in our lifetime we don't have to know that information, but it is good to know because it's good to be prepared. Knowledge is power and knowledge is everything. And then the time, the amount of time from the time you see the flash until the actual fallout occurs, you, you, you don't know that, but on average, they said if you had about eight or ten seconds and you had enough time to really go, wait a second, I live in a single story residence with a raised foundation and I can fit under that crawl space because I went looking for something there when my pipe was leaking in you know, last summer. And if you had the, the wherewithal to just dive under there somehow and get under there, that's the safest place because you would be under, you wouldn't be in, a, you don't have, we don't have many basements in California, but you could at least be under there and face the right direction and get a little protection from the house and maybe some shrubs that are, and, and wood that are around the raised foundation structure. Okay, next slide. So this is just talking again about the apartment buildings. And you can see that in the one on the right, that number 100, blue in the center of the apartment building mock-up, that's 100% safety, that's the safest place besides being underground in the, in the basement area. Next slide. And this is, we're talking about going under the house if you had enough time to actually get down there or you heard on the radio that a bomb's going to be dropped in like, you know, the next few seconds and you have 10, 20 seconds to run under the house. You could even pre-dig out a little thing there, a little ditch and lay that way. And by having the shielding of books or concrete or block wall or some, some apparatus to any kind of solid stuff that would break the contact of the fallout and your body and shield you. Next slide. Okay, so let's skip this slide. Okay, so this is talking about the survival procedure and I think, you know what, with all the speakers we've had tonight, I don't want to take up too much time, but I think we've covered the main topics and um, thank you again, I appreciate your time and next speaker. Also, quick want to remind you that we have the gas company here. Anybody that doesn't know how to turn their um, gas unit on and off, please see them in the back. Um, our next, uh, next speaker is from the Red Cross, and um, he's going to tell us what the Red Cross will do for us um, after the, uh, well, hopefully never, but after there's a um, disaster. So, Rick Garland, are you here? Gerald, I'm sorry. But he's from the Red Cross. He's going to give us just a few minutes of his time and tell us what the Red Cross will do for us after a disaster. Thanks, Sally. 
First of all, I didn't know I was a speaker tonight. <laughs> but I'll do my best. I'll have to see my hands. My name is Rick Gerald. I'm an EMT first responder. I'm also an American Red Cross Health Services Supervisor. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure how I am here. Um, also, I'm a Disaster Frontline Supervisor for the American Red Cross. I've been with the Red Cross since 2008. I've gone on about 20 uh, disaster relief operations um, out of state throughout the nation and also um, a lot of California. Um, my first incident was a Chatsworth train incident. So that was my first re response and I've been with the Red Cross since then. Um, so basically, uh, during an earthquake or during emergencies, during a flood or like in other states there's floods and tornadoes and hurricanes and we're expecting them. So we get um, prepared as teams ready. Um, out here in California, we have shelters all set up and staged. If we have an earthquake, we don't know what the earthquake is going to be. It's, it's, we don't have the convenience of a hurricane or a flood coming in or, or see a tornado come in to know where to set up our um, shelters. So a lot of people are asking, where do we go during an earthquake? It's going to depend on the earthquake. It's going to depend on the damage. Uh, all your lines are going to be busy, so you're going to be trying to call this and that. You're not going to get very much information. Uh, the best information I can tell you is to be calm, be patient, and wait because we, like I said, we need to see how much damage there is, how many people are displaced, and where it's the best and the safest place to set up an uh, evacuation shelter. Uh, we provide your immediate needs. We provide you with showers, hot meals, a bed, towels, toothbrush, toothpaste. Also, another thing, during a disaster, uh, fires especially, uh, you have to run out. You have to run out. Uh, you, you forget your documents, your license, your insurance papers. Red Cross provides these bags and they didn't give me too many today and I think I got rid of what I had. But you put copies of your documents and you put them in your freezer. And it's sealed airtight. And in most cases, they will not get damaged. Your ice cream's going to melt, but your paperwork will be fine. But put copies in here. You can keep the originals on you, but you put it in your freezer and they'll survive a disaster. Uh, I don't know what else to elaborate on. Um, like I said, be patient, be calm. Uh, they were talking about water, which water is safe to drink, which water is not. The, the pool deal and the bleach deal is good. Uh, have have and matches because it's always safe to boil the water. People talk about, is the toilet water safe? Is the hot water boiler, the, the heater safe? Once. What happens once you, you're through with that water, or you flush the toilet, or you use any water from the heater, it refills. Is that water contaminated that's coming back in? I don't know. We don't have these answers either of how safe your water is. That's why, and I don't want to overlap on everything, but that's why they say to have fresh water handy. Or, like I say, have, have a uh, lighter or matches to boil it. Uh, what else can I have on? Oh, I guess I've been through about 18 different states and different type of disasters. And LA Fire is the best I've seen. And I've worked with a lot of fire companies in other states and LA Fire to be the number. I've been in New York, you know, so I, I know the difference. <laughs> no, we, we're there and we know what we're doing and I'm not putting any other fire station down. But we are number one as, as far as my experience goes. So I just want to give our state a pass. Uh, so that's about all I have here. I got a lot of swag. Oh, also we have these, these brochures here. And it's a calendar. It tells you how to get prepared in 21 days. And like day by day or week by week what, what to get. And you'll be ready for that. Big day that's apparently coming. Okay. But everyone, everyone's guaranteeing you, but hopefully not. Uh, and we also have the gas wrenches, but I think someone from the gas company's here. But if, if, these are to um, shut off your gas. Uh, any new gas lines or even retrofitted lines, if there's an earthquake and your your gas line shakes, it's going to shut off automatically. Okay, so you might want to know how to turn it back on in the case of this. I had a, a gas meter and the kid next door, 
he kept he get off his scooter and he slammed it against my gas meter. So my gas would keep coming off. So they work. Okay, so even as little as a, as a scooter hitting it, it would turn it off. Uh, so we have other red cross wraps that I don't want to overlap on anybody else. And like I said, I'm going in the back and get some of this information. And that's what I got for tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Susan, we're going to hold the questions till the end. Okay? Thank you. I mean, yeah, okay. Uh, our next speaker, right here from Granada Hills, and I'll let him introduce himself with his title, but it's Mike Panman. 